Look at Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me. This is Jesus speaking. Come unto me, all ye that labor. One version there says, all who work to exhaustion and are heavy laden, overburdened. Would you say that with me? Overburdened. Would you say that one more time, but emphasize the word over? 
overburden. It's one thing to have burdens, but then there comes that point where it's just one too many. Jesus said to those who may be exhausted or overburdened, come unto me and I will give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I want to pause for a moment and ask you, is there any parts of the Bible that you acted like you knew what it meant all your life? And you said, it's got to be good. It's the Bible. But inside, it kind of didn't make sense. All right, y'all don't have to say amen. Or, but I'll confess, this is one of those parts. Yoke, to me, that's a big wooden bar that goes on the shoulders of oxen. Looks heavy. Yoke rhymes with choke. I'm not interested in having something else being placed on me that's heavy. And I'll admit throughout my life, later in this verse, Jesus said, and, and my burden is light. Take my, I didn't want anything to do with an extra yoke or burden. But in the last few years, feel like I got a different understanding of what Jesus was saying and we're going to talk about that for a little bit today so let's read verse 29 and 30 Jesus said take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls a moment ago he said if you're burdened I'll give you rest well that can be a nap <laughs> naps are good somebody say amen Oh, I got a lot more amens on that one. Naps are good. Rest is good. But it's a whole different realm when he said rest for your souls. That goes inside the rib cage. That goes into the mind and the heart and our life. That's, that's our core. And Jesus is saying, I, I can give you peace and rest there. For my yoke is easy. I know it looks like something added. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy. And I just word studied that word easy. And I was amazed at all that came out from that one word. My yoke is easy. It's better. It's good. It's gracious. It's kind. It's comfortable. And it's pleasant. Jesus is not trying to add to the weight that pulls you down. Jesus is offering to help you and to minister to you and to encourage your life and my life. I wanna to minister today for a few moments on this subject. You are not alone. Could we pray together one more time? Lord, in your name, we worship you and honor you. We exalt you, Jesus. Let your word come forth today. Let your spirit move and minister in this house today. Let your presence do what only you can do. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless and you may be seated. Decided in life that I will only carry what God desires for me to carry. We still carry some things, even in serving the Lord, but I've decided I will only carry what God wants for me to carry. I'm not going to carry what the enemy tries to put on me and I'm going to do my best not to pile on things myself. I, I only plan on carrying if, if it's something that God has allowed to be in our lives to carry. And then I, I want to take it a step further. I, I only want to carry it in the manner that God wants me to carry it. If there are some things to carry, I'm not going to carry it my way by the grace of God. I'm not going to carry it the way the devil would like to me to carry it. If I'm going to carry some things, I plan on carrying that the way God wants me to. So for a few moments today, let's talk about some of our burdens. Let's talk about how burdens or weights can come into our lives. And then we'll talk a few minutes about this concept of a yoke and much more specifically the yoke that Jesus offers for us and what that entails. Now, speaking of burdens, of weights, how do we 
end up with so many burdens. Am I the only one in the room that feels like you're a burden collector sometimes? <laughs> Added weight, extra things to carry. Let me just, 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 just tell you, we, we, we end up carrying a lot in our lives and, and we pick up extra things. And sometimes we get more than we ask for in a certain part of life and and sometimes we accumulate more than we realize. Let me give you an example. Southern born, southern bred, amen. And I feel like I'm still in the south, amen, even though I'm a little north here in Arkansas. The main worship song today had the word ain't in it two times. I feel like we're in the south, <laughs> amen. Thank you, Brother Dean, for sharing that with me. He, he leaned over. He said, you kind of feel like you're in the South. We got ain't in our worship song. I'm like, that's good. And, and, and born and raised, ministry, evangelized some, traveled, but, but as far as living, it was Louisiana, and then was called a pastor in Colorado and moved up there and discovered something in Colorado that's really cool that other parts of the country have and y'all may have here, but we don't in Louisiana, we don't in Arkansas. That is something called basements. Everybody say basements. And most of your basements are, are unfinished. Am I telling the truth, Allison? Some people finish them, make them, you know, livable and all that. But a lot of them are concrete studs. And if your upstairs is 1,800 square feet, guess what? Your downstairs is 1,800 square feet. We don't get that in Louisiana. In Louisiana, you have three pieces of plywood in your attic. And you, throw, you shove boxes in. Oh, yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. And you rent storage units and you have a garage storage unit and you have closets and you have under your bed and you have stuff everywhere because we collect stuff. But it goes to a different level in Colorado where you have a basement because anything, almost anything that you would give away that you would garage sale, that you would bring to Goodwill, somehow it just becomes easier. You put it in a box and you go, what should we do with this? Oh, just bring it to the basement. And that's fine and dandy until the Lord deals with your heart eight years later, releases you and you resign from that pastor and you move back to Louisiana where there's not basements. And when you're packing to move, you realize I have saved every book that I ever bought for ministry. I have saved every toy that our kids ever had, ever. I don't know where all that stuff came from. We gave away. We sold, we gave away, we brought it to the curb and the trailer was still full. And I, I just a few months ago quit paying storage in Louisiana to have a spot to put all that stuff. Because living there allowed us to accumulate more than we realize. That's a story about a house, but it happens in our life going through the journey of life and a hurt comes and we make it, but it's another box in the basement or a situation happens or unfolds and another burden. Hey, I just, I just had a concept just came to me in living for Jesus, let's not allow basements, but we do accumulate and we gather and collect. And sometimes in life, we have all we can handle and then something can transpire, something can unfold. That is that proverbial straw on the camel's back or the, the place in the navigation where burdened becomes overburdened or being able to handle it shifts to overwhelming. I share a story that I honestly confess from the start is not spiritual, but I believe it can help us make a spiritual application. Years ago, 
I fell in love with deer hunting in my 20s. Some friends brought me. I'd never even been deer hunting until my 20s and fell in love with deer hunting and, and started getting spoiled to, to the, the deer sausage in the freezer. It's just, just amazing. Still love it. I can tell you exactly how I like it, the three kinds I like the best, and, and send them on, and, and we, we'll take care of it. And, and there was a season where I just didn't have a deer and it was through the end of the season. Normally I hunted through October, a little bit November and then December and then I was done, but it was January and I, I just didn't have a deer yet. And on a Friday afternoon, a guy named Steve, he, he, he said, Greg, we're going hunting tomorrow. You want to get your gear together and we'll go. And so I got my gear together and we made it Friday night to his camp and he had scouted this area, but I had never been there. It was public land. And many of you that hunt or camp maybe on public land, you know there are some roads you can only drive a vehicle on certain roads. Then there are four-wheeler trails that you can take a four-wheeler on. And then most of state or federal lands are a lot of those properties are walk only on the majority of them. Our hunting area was two miles from the truck. I mean, two miles. I've decided later in life, I just don't hate deer that bad. <laughs> That's a long ways to go. But two miles from the truck. One mile was four-wheeler trail, and then the last mile was walking. Now, let me explain. It had been raining a lot, and the water was standing, like, like had been standing is, is swampy Louisiana territory just and the water was anywhere from one two to six inches deep most of the entire walk you have on mud boots now let me just paint this picture for you because it was it was interesting from the get-go all right Steve was a bigger guy than me you have two dudes two climbing stands mine weighed 26 pounds it's on your back with straps two backpacks loaded to the gills for an all day hunt, two rifles. So you got two dudes, two climbing stands, big and bulky, two backpacks, two rifles, one four wheeler. That's pretty interesting already. And then I had this cart that folded up that if you got a deer, you were supposed to be able to put the deer on the cart and pull it out. So it's not only the two dudes, two clowns, all of that. One of the dudes, me, is holding the cart rolling behind the four-wheeler. It was already rugged. We make it the mile on the four-wheeler. We make it the mile, almost a mile walking. And I don't know if this is technically a name for mud, but there's mud and then there's suction mud. Suction in the mud makes a noise every step. Your boot gets almost stuck and you every step. And we're walking through water four, five, six inches deep. And then we come to this and I'm wore out already. And it's only, it's 4.30 in the morning. Sun ain't even coming up for another hour, hour and a half. And, and, and we get to this little rise and I realize I'm not walking in water for the first time. I'm not walking in water. This is a little ridge. The deer may like crossing here because it's a little ridge. I said, Steve, I believe this might be a crossing in all of this water. Steve, I'm going to find a tree and I'm climbing. I don't know where you scouted for me, but my, uh, my, my deer senses tell me to climb a tree right here. This may be a crossing. What I wasn't telling him is I'm not walking another step in this crazy suction mud and I'm climbing a tree and I don't care if a deer ever comes within 100 miles of here. I ain't going another half mile down the trail. <laughs> so I stopped right there. Steve kept on walking. I climbed up my tree in my tree stand. Sitting there, sun came up. First few hours, didn't see anything. It was a bucks only day. Sure enough, 9.30, 9.45, I saw a deer cross the trail. I'm like, ah, oh, that might have been a doe. May have a buck with it. Sure enough, a few moments later, here, it wasn't a huge buck, but a buck stepped out in the trail about 100 yards down. I got him. It fell on the spot in the trail where we would be leaving. Yeah, yeah. Hour later, Steve, 
packs up, you know, about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Here he comes because he, he went another 15 minutes. Here he comes. He gets to me. I heard a shot. Did you, did you shoot? Did you get one? Nah, nah, that must have been another hunter. And we climb down, get all our gear together, and we're starting to leave. And we almost trip on my deer. I mean, I got you, man. <laughs> and I got a deer. And we were excited. Little did I realize those moments of celebration were the last few moments for the next three days that I would celebrate getting a deer. Little did I realize I was going to come to despise the fact that a dumb deer stepped out on my trail and I shot him. We celebrated. And then we had to try to get back to the four-wheeler and we had to try to get back to the truck. Now we had two dudes, two climbing stands, two backpacks, two rifles, and 160 pounds, pardon the pun, of dead weight. on this little cart that had wheels almost as skinny as a 10-speed bike. <laughs> you don't do that for a cart that's supposed to help you in the mud. It sunk. <laughs> it's okay to laugh, sis. It's all right. It was bad. <laughs> I lie not. I, I, I don't believe it's possible for me to over-exaggerate this story. We put the deer on the cart, a bunch of bungee cords, I know we look redneck, but we had the climbing stands, backpacks, and we're, we're trying to haul this thing out the woods. We make it for a few minutes, felt like to me we had to be halfway back to the four-wheeler. My thighs were starting that pounding. Some of y'all that run uphill or work out, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, you feel your heart beating and, and, and your legs are turning to jello. And I'm like, Steve, I got to stop. I got to rest. You think we're almost halfway back to the truck? Steve said, Greg, I promise. Greg, turn around and look. You see that tree sticking out? That's the tree you were hunting in. We'd only made it about 50 or 70 yards. We made it a little further. We made it a little further. We started falling, like getting stuck, and the backpacks were muddy. The deer was muddy. The stands were muddy. Our guns were muddy. I can't, it, this, this, it got bad. I'll date myself on this story, but I lost a flip phone in the mud. Don't care, see you later. <laughs> and I got to the point that I started thinking, if Steve won't tell anybody, nobody will know that I got a deer. We can put it in the woods. Coyotes need to eat too. We, we can just walk on back, didn't get a deer. Somehow, we made it. We made it to the four-wheeler. We made it back to the truck. Then we cleaned the deer, and it was probably two to three days later where I finally was able to say, hey, I got a deer. I couldn't stand that thing for three days. <laughs> and you know what the worst part about it? We were there because we wanted to be there. Yep. And we called it fun. <laughs> Somebody elbow your husband and say, yeah, you do that too. You get up at three. <laughs> you, you, and you call it fun. But on the trip that was already maxed out, the two stands and the two backpacks and the two guns, we were maxed out just getting there. And then in the journey, something happened that added more weight that caused burdened to be overburdened, that caused heavy to almost be too much to handle. I told you it wasn't a spiritual story, but I think you're with me now. And you and I have had these things happen in life where we're navigating life and we're walking through the journey and we're doing all we can to make it. And then something can happen or something can unfold and our life is hit with a trial or a storm or a, an unseen sickness 
comes or a home breaks up or we may make a bad choice in a weak moment and something can happen and all of a sudden we have an added burden in the journey that almost seems too much to bear and it leaves us with more to carry. It leaves us with a residue or this life burden now. I, I've got some more preaching to do for a few moments but could we take about a 60 second pause and just close our eyes and lift our hands to the heavens and ask just wherever you are in your life just ask the Holy Ghost to minister for the next few moments and the Holy Ghost to bless and strengthen in this house we do that right now Jesus we honor you we love you Lord we worship you Jesus And, and if we're not careful, that, that added burden may have never struggled with bitterness before, but now bitterness can come or unforgiveness or hurt and guilt and anger or oppression or depression these things start trying to attach almost like boxes that now want to collect in our basement because of things we we've, we've gone through that's that's burdens you don't have to confess or have testimony service but anybody know what i'm talking about life can bring weights and burdens and things and then things start getting uh, attached to that so we we've talked for a few moments about burdens and weights that can come in our lives but let's talk for a little while about this concept of a yoke and very specifically the concept of the yoke that Jesus offers. If we can put the picture on the screen, notice the yoke. It's, you can look up different definitions from different locations. It's a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals, usually oxen. But here's something that I found in almost every definition of a yoke that I looked up. So that's awesome by itself. If Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, if, if all it is is a piece that connects two beings together, then Jesus is saying, I want to be connected with you. I want to be linked with you. That's awesome part. of that's, that's already great. But what really ministered to me is the second portion of the definition. It said it's not only... A, attached over the necks of two animals, but it also has an attachment that attaches to the plow or the cart that they are to pull. Do you see that ring in the middle of that yoke? In the construct, in the building of a yoke, Part of, it's not just a, a cross piece with, with equipment to make sure they're connected to it and to each other. But in almost every definition I found of a yoke, here's another one. A yoke is a wooden bar that joins two oxen to each other and to the burden that they pull. That yoke is built to connect those two beings together but it has an attachment that says whatever is being pulled, whatever is being carried, whatever is having to be moved, there is now provision that is made for you to link up with Jesus. He said Jesus said take my yoke upon you and learn of me it connects to the burden that is to be pulled and then I, I love the the just the looking at it you can see the curves that are over the shoulders and and in and these are carved so that it prevents chafing on these animals and in some countries they even have sheepskin wool on that curved piece that is to set on the shoulder of the oxen and that reminds me where Jesus said take my yoke it's easy it's better it's pleasant it's good I'm here to tell somebody in the house today he's not trying to add one ounce to your load he's trying to help you he's trying to help you make it he's trying to help you carry whatever you you're facing and navigate whatever you're going through it's not going to be painful it's not no no much the opposite it's going to help you it's pleasant and it's good to join with Jesus so two things 
He's offering to stand beside you and he's offering to help carry the load. Now I'm getting a little bit different understanding of what he meant when he said, take my yoke upon you. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul is teaching, and I'm not about to start a relationship lesson message right now. Don't get worried about that. But Paul is giving us instruction as believers to be careful. And Paul made this statement, do not be unequally yoked. Would you say that with me? Unequally yoked. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. An elder in Louisiana, I visited with him and had a good long talk and was studying yokes and talked about it. And he's a collector of antique things for his barn. It's not, a, it's not a, as much of a working barn as it is a good looking barn with cool antiques in it. And he has a yoke that looks off kilter. And he said, Greg, I bought it at the auction just because it was cool. It was an old yoke. He said, but I asked them, why is it so off kilter? They said, it's an uneven yoke. Unequal or uneven yokes could be used to train a young oxen. And they could be rigged where the stronger, bigger oxen took most of the load and most of the burden. And he said, they just told me it was an uneven, an unequal yoke. And he said, I've got it hanging in my barn because I liked it. Amen. Paul said, don't be unequally yoked. Oh, that elder also told me, he said, the stronger, uh, more experienced oxen is always hooked up closer to the load. He says, so it can carry the biggest part of the load. Yes, elder, you preach to me that God says, take my yoke upon you. Amen. He's going to carry most of the load when I join up with Jesus. But I got to thinking, if there's a such thing as an unequal yoke, and Paul said, don't do it in relationships. Be careful. But if there is a such thing as an unequal yoke, and Jesus looked at me and looked at you and said, take my yoke upon you. That means he's standing on the other side. He's linked to it. He's connected to it. And he's standing there and he's saying, Greg, would you get in the other side of this apparatus? Because I want to help you carry your load. Somebody hear me. If there's ever been an unequal yoke, that's it. Because my Jesus stands beside me when I have no strength. He stands beside you when you can't even move the pile. He stands beside you when you feel like you're trying and you can't budge what you have to carry. Jesus has all power and he has all strength. Amen. He, he offers that to you. Now, I know a yoke is mostly for oxen. But if, if, it, if it were horses then I've decided this is what it looks like. <laughs> it's okay to grin. But when I see this, I grin and cry because he's my Clydesdale. He's on the other side of that wooden yoke we showed a moment ago. He's that Clydesdale and he's standing on the other side and he's offering whatever you're carrying, whatever's overloading you, whatever's overbearing you. It's not too big for me, Greg. It's not too much for me, Greg. It's not too much to handle, Greg. You and I got, can I tell somebody in the house? Amen. I don't know if you've ever looked up at Jesus and said, you're my Clydesdale, but I have. I looked up up at Jesus and said, I can't even budget today, but I, you said I could yoke with you. You would take my burdens. You would help me carry them. Would somebody lift their hands to the heavens right now? You're not alone. You're not alone. Jesus is with you. You're not carrying it alone. You're not navigating life alone. Let's just keep our hands up another moment more right now. We give you honor, Jesus. We give you praise right now. We worship you right now, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 He, he, he stands beside you. A yoke is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means I, I'm in covenant with him. I'm linked up to him with provision to carry. I, I close sharing a story that happened earlier in my life and early in ministry. 
filled with the Holy Ghost, called to preach, doing my best to follow and pursue the Lord. You know, I, I made some mistakes. I fell hard. My heart was for God. Just, just, just hit, hit a rough patch. Coming out of that, I mean, right with God, serving God, repented. I tell people, if you ever mess up, get good at repenting. Well, I repented really. I meant it. I mean, I, I, I got it in God's hands. Had accountability going forward, serving the Lord, sensing this calling. But now in those next five years, maybe even 10 years, now there was this dual situation going on. I was following this calling where God was trying to take me, but now it felt like there was something trying to pull me back saying, you can never go there because of what's here. Anybody, anybody ever felt that before? You, you just can't go there because of what's here. It became tormenting and it came to a place where my calling almost felt like a curse. God, if I can't really go there, I was believing some of the lies of the devil. If I can't really go there, then take it away from me because this keeps pulling me back. So I go to general conference one year and I remember at the prayer time, I'm on the side of the platform and praying my heart out and a man of God comes over and begins to pray for me. He put his hands on both sides of my head. That's, that's a whole nother level from just laying hands on the forehead. I'll just tell y'all. If you're a guest, I'm just telling you in advance, this is really good praying, but if they grab both sides of your head and shake, it's on now, all right? And he grabbed both sides of my head and he, he was crying out to God for, it felt like about 10 minutes and he was just praying. And I, I only would use this word maybe three times in my life, but I had a vision as real as if I was watching a, a video. While he's praying, I'm praying. I see myself, a rope is around my waist and there's this like military grade looking big, huge duffel bag, just a big old olive colored canvas looking thing. And, it, and I knew in that instant, that's my mess. That's my past. That's my mistakes. And here's what just mirrored perfectly what was happening in my life was when I was strong, I could pull it. Fast a couple days, pray real good, I could pull it. But let me have a weak day or struggle day, it was pulling me. The devil would get on it. He would pull it backwards. He would open it up and start throwing everything. He just made one, one little mistake, but he'd throw everything out and pull you backwards. So while we're praying, just a, it's a vision, so it's, it's, it's um, just what unfolded. A hand comes down with these large pair of shears or scissors. Hand comes down, and right at the duffel bag, the hand cuts the rope, and the duffel bag was as if on a, on a large cliff, just And at that point in the vision, I'm celebrating like this stuff is gone. The devil ain't going to be able to mess with me anymore about that stuff. It's gone. Let me just pause and look at one more scripture as we're closing. Can we put Isaiah, the Isaiah scripture on, on the screen? The Assyrians were tormenting Israel. And God said, I'm about to put a stop to it. And notice what God said about the Assyrians and the Assyrian king. This is the only other verse in the Bible. And somebody hear me. This is the only verse in the Bible that I find burden and yoke in the same verse. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. In this verse, the Lord spoke and said that the, his burden, talking about the Assyrians that were tormenting Israel, his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off of thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Here's what I get. 
God says, I offer to link with you. I offer to connect with you to carry your burdens my way. But the enemy, he tries to connect with us to live life and carry the burdens his way. And God came in and spoke and said, I'm about to destroy. He wants to destroy you. He wants to let this extra burdens and things overwhelm you. He wants to rob your calling and rob your anointing and destroy your home and mess with your family and make you think you're never going to make it and you can't live for God. Amen. I'm here to tell you, not only are we going to link up in the next few minutes with God's anointing for how to carry, but somebody's going to get a deliverance today. Somebody's going to get a freedom today. Somebody's going to gain an understanding. I've been trying to, the devil wants to destroy me. He's been trying to link up with me and destroy me with this stuff, but God's going to destroy what he's trying to use to destroy me. Amen. Some of Please understand, I'm not saying you linked up with the devil, but I'm saying when we're not doing it God's way, the devil tries to attach that stuff to us, and his goal is to destroy. So the anointing comes and says, if you're carrying it wrong, the anointing's in the house and say, we're going to take care of that. I got an anointing that we're going to get the devil's mess off, his burdens off, his yoke, any way to link up with his way off, and we're going to do it God's way. So in that vision... If it would have stopped right there, that was incredibly, wonderfully, victorious cause for rejoicing in my heart. The old duffel bag had been cut away and fell down the cliff. But the vision didn't stop there. And this is where I feel like God kind of started giving me this picture. I didn't put it together till later, but he started giving me this picture of what his yoke meant. Because that hand that had just cut the rope right at that duffel bag, gone, put the shears down, picked up the rope. And it was a vision, so the hand could walk or whatever. But the hand began just moving the rope. Remember, it's connected to my waist. I'm in the middle. The hand picked the rope up and been carrying it in a half circle. And when it got to about right here, I saw something in front of me and I looked and it was about a 20 foot tall image of Jesus. And he's standing about 20 feet in front of me and he's looking over his shoulder and the hand comes, wraps the rope around the waist of my Lord and Savior that's tied to my waist. Now, instead of being tied to the past, I'm tied to Jesus. Now, instead of being tied to what's behind me, I'm tied to what's in front of me. Now, instead of being tied to what to destroy me, I'm tied to what's going to heal me and what's going to help me and what's going to lead me and what's going to guide me and what's going to protect me and what's going to save me. Amen. Now I'm tied to my hope. I'm tied to a future. I'm tied to love. I'm tied to grace. I'm tied to that calling. Hallelujah. 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 And looking over his shoulder, the Lord spoke these words in the vision and said, now instead of being tied to your past and to failure that would destroy, you are tied to your hope and you are tied to your future. And now when you're tired, instead of being pulled backwards, now I'll help pull you forward. I'll pull you towards your destiny. I'll lead you toward the future that I have planned for you. Amen. That to me is what it means to be yoked up with Jesus. I'm not going down. You're not going down. The devil's not going to win. God. God is with you. God is with you. You are not alone.